Welcome back to Capital Beat, brought to you by the Vermont Press Bureau and Orca Media. I'm Bureau Chief Neil Goswami, and joining me as always is Vermont Press Bureau reporter Josh O'Gorman. It's week four in the legislature, and we're going to talk about the all-payer model presented by the administration earlier this week. We'll talk marijuana legislation with Senator Dick Sears, and we'll bring you up to speed on the education bill making its way through the chambers. But first, let's talk to Lawrence Miller, Chief of Healthcare Reform with the Shumlin Administration. Thanks so, so much for being here. Absolutely. Earlier this week, uh, you and others presented the proposal uh, that you plan to present to the federal government for an all-payer model. Uh, we've been talking about this for a number of years now here in Montpelier, and I'm assuming there's a lot of people outside of this bubble we operate in that are quite unfamiliar with an all-payer model. So if you could first maybe give us a brief, uh, a brief overview of what, an, what the all-payer model is and what it plans to do with our healthcare system. Sure, this is based on a model that's at work in Maryland already and mm -hmm. has been stood up for a number of years. In Maryland, that's just about hospital inpatient. What this is about is a, a transformative way of paying for care. So within a framework agreement with the feds, um, you can shift from fee-for-service to capitated payments and really have provider-led transformation of health care. It goes back to previous times when your primary care doc, mm -hmm. your primary care practice was the one where you could really turn for assistance and they would be paid to take care of you uh, in a more comprehensive way. Um, I think what you'll see in critical elements, uh, there are no changes for beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. So if you're on Medicare, you don't see a change in your benefits. You don't see a change in co-pays. You don't see, a, see those sorts of changes. This is about how practices align themselves to deliver care together and coordinate that care and really make a system out of our healthcare uh, industry mm -hmm. that isn't really a system today. Now, when we talk about fee for service, we should clarify that currently healthcare providers are, are essentially paid based on the procedures they perform or the tasks that they perform when they're dealing with a patient. That's right. Um, the more you do, the more you get paid. Correct. And, and you and others in the administration argue that that's really a perverse incentive. Uh, that that uh, the healthcare industry should be focused on better quality outcomes. So, uh, explain how it would work. We go from fee for service. What would doctors and nurses and others be paid for under an all payer model? Doctors, nurses, and others become part of one system. Um, if you th you can think about it as covering the overhead. Mm -hmm and then moving dollars to the incremental costs. Right now, a hospital has to have an emergency room, for right. example. That emergency room is gonna be open however many a day, hours a day, and it costs a certain amount. But it isn't busy all the time, so it doesn't necessarily pay for itself. So other procedures that are practiced in the hospital have to pay for the emergency room, and therefore they have to do those procedures. Right. If we go ahead and say we're going to pool all the money from the different payers and then we're going to make a lump sum payment that keeps that emergency room open because we need an emergency room every 35 miles in Vermont, then that's taken care of. And the rest of the hospital doesn't have to figure out, oh, how do we make money to cover that? Mm -hmm. Same thing for other heavy capital uh, items like MRI machines and CAT scans. And then the primary care doctors aren't sitting there figuring out how do I fit yay many 15 minute increments in because I've got to cover that other stuff. Mm -hmm. They've got their overhead covered as well. And when it comes to needing to spend an hour with a patient who needs it, they can do that and not be harmed financially. Has this turned out to be a sustainable model for the hospital system in Maryland? It has been a very sustainable model for the hospital system in Maryland. They feel like it's been very successful. And one of the neat things is that it provides an incentive for them to spend money on behavioral health supports and other things that you don't necessarily associate with acute medical care that really helps people have a better quality of life and better health outcomes. Um, 
Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital, for example, was having high readmission rates for people who were homeless who had come through the emergency room. By providing transitional housing, they were able to operate their emergency room at a better cost structure, uh, so they were able to provide the transitional housing, all the emergency room services, way significant reduction in readmissions for that population, total, over, total overall lower cost for treating that population, much better outcomes for those folks. And, and we're kind of exploring something similar to that because we're looking, we're looking for permission to expand Medicare to include substance abuse treatment, right? We're, the spoke model. Exactly. There's uh, no coverage in Medicare today. And it's, if you can think about why we call it an all-payer model, it's because we want to align the way commercial, Medicaid, and Medicare pay so that a doctor or a practitioner doesn't have to wonder what can I do for this patient? They're able to uh, treat the patient the best way possible through the community health team model, through coordinated care, um, in, in a seamless way regardless of the source of funding. And that's really the heart of it. We need to, uh, to make it easier and better uh, for our practices to, to do what they know how to do well. Uh, Lawrence, this is a by any measure a radical transformation of the the payment system in our healthcare system. Um, you mentioned that it would involve commercial insurance as well as uh, private insurance in the government programs, and we're talking Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, as you know, there are a number of criticisms lingering out there about this type of proposal. Uh, number one is that you're operating under a global budget with capitated payments, um, and some argue that that would lead to rationing of care. Uh, an another criticism is that the, uh, the program would sort of uh, change in some way uh, how seniors receive care and benefits through, through Medicare. I know you've made the case a number of times that those are not fair criticisms. Um, Let's hear it again. Sure. Well, I think it's important to understand that this is evolution, not revolution. I mean, these are big changes, but they're not changes that have not been tried elsewhere. And if you look at organized systems like Kaiser Permanente for its members, or the Cleveland Clinic, or the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, um, these systems are working uh, in America today. Um, if you look at where Medicare is going, this is aligned with where Medicare is going and takes advantages of the systems that they're putting in place as part of the next generation model. Secretary Burwell has announced that they want to see 80% of Medicare beneficiaries treated in alternative payment models mm -hmm. uh, over the next few years. The reason they want to do that is because what they've seen is that results in better outcomes for the Medicaid population not because it saves money, but because it provides better outcomes. Mm -hmm. The result of better outcomes is saving money, but the primary objective right. is better outcomes for beneficiaries. Okay. And I think that's the, um, that's the part uh, that, that people also don't quite understand is this isn't about the state stepping in the middle of this. Mm -hmm. This is about the state providing a framework and regulatory structure that supports provider-led mm -hmm. innovation, where the doctors and the nurses, psychologists, and, and designated agencies, all of the people who really work with people on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis, where they're leading uh, this practice transformation. Before we get to what the state is actually seeking from the federal government in the process of, of uh, obtaining that approval, uh, I want to talk first about, you mentioned next generation and how Medicare is sort of uh, urging states in, in, in healthcare systems to move toward the ACO model, the Accountable uh, Care Organization model. We have that in place in, I think, two instances here in Vermont. Three, we three, have three, three Accountable Care Organizations okay. what, uh, who uh, are practicing in what's called a shared savings program. Okay. So what, is, what are we finding, what are the early findings from these ACOs in terms of health outcomes and in terms of cost savings? The early findings appear to indicate uh, good health outcome improvements. Only one of the shared savings program resulted in redeeming shared savings. 
but uh, all showed um, some cost benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also had the blueprint for health operating right. in Vermont for a long time and community health teams that have shown a lot of power in um, transforming care. Mm -hmm. And uh, care coordination is a really big deal. Right. Um, you know, a, a very significant portion of healthcare spending every year is on a very small percentage of the population. And it's people who are having significant complications from multiple chronic conditions in a given year, um, as well as some acute issues. And if we're able to really coordinate care for that group of people, you can see a lot of savings. But remember, a lot of our health infrastructure is fixed cost. Mm -hmm. It's a capital intensive business. And if you were designing it from the ground up, you wouldn't necessarily finance it the way we're doing. So I think what we're moving to is a financial system that's better aligned with the way the business of healthcare is structured that will provide docs a better opportunity to fulfill their moral uh, aspirations mm -hmm. in the care that they provide patients. Okay. As we noted uh, earlier this week, the administration presented the all-payer model it envisions. It requires a number of approvals and waivers from the federal government. Uh, lay out the process from here forward. For sure. Us. So um, we, we did submit um, the term sheet on Monday mm -hmm. um, to uh, uh, senior management at, at CMS. Um, they'll be reviewing uh, that with lawyers and actuaries right. and and everyone else, we've you know we've had a lot of discussions with them so far, as you know. Um, but now it needs this formal process mm -hmm. to come up with what the actual agreement um, would look like, and that's very detailed. Yeah. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board is getting an introduction uh, to the all-payer model, and that's scheduled for a day and a half of hearings. So, um, you know, this is not not uh, good soundbite material, <laughs> um, but. Uh, that that public process is very important as we move towards implementation. Uh, it doesn't have a lot to do with affecting the framework of the agreement, but in terms of how that framework is expressed, that needs everybody who works in the community mm -hmm. uh, of healthcare to uh, participate. It needs participation by patients, um, by people who. Uh, uh, both represent consumers and are consumers mm -hmm. um, in that area, and that's all of us. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the, what you'll see in Vermont over the next uh, a couple of months is that public process unfolding while the agency mm -hmm. um, uh, works on reviewing our proposal. And those two will come together at some point, and then we'll see how far we've gotten with right. the federal government and what the public comments are. and. Uh, be at a decision point. So, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, ultimately, January 1, 2017 is, is the goal here for rolling out and beginning implementation. Exactly. But remember that this also includes a lot of system changes. Mm -hmm. uh, Medicare uh, is needing to move to a new way to pay. Um, when that system is going to be ready mm -hmm. is an open question. Um, and this needs to be done incrementally. We're right. talking about a big system. Yeah. Um, we are talking about uh, significant adjustments. Um, and the one thing we know is that, that we want to take this and uh, break it into bite-sized pieces mm -hmm. um, that can be managed effectively. Okay. So we know that the Obama administration supports moving to the all-payer model. We also, we also know there's going to be an administration change the 20th of January of next year. Is there a sense of urgency to get this completed while we still have an administration in place that supports this change? Well, we're also leaving in January of next year. <laughs> so there's a very right. explicit this is sense true. of urgency this is, right. this is, um, this is true. to right. accomplish uh, <laughs> uh, the foundation um, and to be able to provide uh, uh, sort of everything in a stable condition for the transition. Lawrence, before, before we let you go, I just want to check in on Vermont Health Connect, the, uh, the state's online health insurance uh, marketplace. We know that uh, the, the change of circumstance function was taken offline for a time and a, a smaller backlog of requested changes had begun to build, yep. uh, maybe up to 4,000 or so. I think we were at 5,700. Um, Monday before uh, we were able to begin okay. processing again. We did uh, complete an update over the weekend that allows us to begin processing changes again. Mm -hmm. um, previously, we'd been running about 300 
a day. Um, so I do anticipate that that backlog will be resolved over the course of a few okay. weeks or, or through February. And as you're aware, the, the re-emergence of the backlog raised some consternation in this building with lawmakers. Are you comfortable that you'll be able to explain this process moving forward, reduce that backlog and make everyone comfortable? Oh, definitely. And I think it just, I mean, it requires demonstrated progress. Right. Um, I did announce in October that we would be um, suspending change of circumstances, mm -hmm. and I reaffirmed that um, when we returned. I'm not sure that people really wrap their brain around right. what that meant. What that would mean. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we did have a very successful renewal season. Um, we completed the renewal process four months before we did last year. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very substantial improvement. Everybody's 1095 tax forms uh, going out on time, mm -hmm. a very significant accomplishment. We've begun uh, renewals for the Medicaid population, which is very important to make sure that uh, people are still eligible for Medicaid and, and we don't have anybody on Medicaid who's not eligible. Um, so, you know, it's in a much better place than it was a year ago. Uh, that doesn't mean there won't continue to be right. uh, rough patches from okay. time to time. We'll leave the health care talk there for this week. Lawrence Miller, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. And we're back with Senator Dick Sears of Bennington County, Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator, you have been working very diligently on a bill to legalize marijuana. Uh, you met with the governor early this week, earlier this week in front of the press to outline a bill, a scaled back bill, that would in, in essence legalize marijuana uh, in small amounts and allow the retail sale of marijuana in uh, some limited circumstances. Uh, you were sitting here Friday morning and your committee will be taking a vote later this morning mm -hmm. on the legislation. Give us an update of, of, first of all, the prospects of it and the attempts you've made to scale it back to make it palatable for most of Vermonters. Well, first of all, um, I'm calling it a bill that removes the civil penalties for the possession of one ounce or less of marijuana for those who are over the age of 21. Right. Um, and that's really the only uh, criminal significant criminal change. There are some changes in furnishing that respond to the people who are over 21 furnishing marijuana and other products to kids who are particularly those under 18. But um, the, so the, while there are some new criminal penalties, mm -hmm. the real issue here is the possession. Um, and technically, it's not January a criminal first, statute, right? right because it was already a, criminal, a civil. It was already a civil camp yeah. penalty mm -hmm. from uh, 2013. Right. We decriminalized the possession, so it is a civil penalty of 200 to 500, depending upon the number of times mm -hmm. you've been caught with the ounce. The bill also uh, would not allow people to use marijuana in public, mm -hmm. a public place. Right. It would not allow people to. Um, drive under the influence of marijuana, it does nothing like that. It, it, it continues and it improves upon our, I think, improves on our effort to combat drug driving. And um, it's not just people who drive under the influence of marijuana, uh, but people who drive under the influence of any substance. Could be a prescription drug or it could be a, a heroin or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, the bill is not effective in terms of the retail sale and lifting the civil penalties until July 1, 2018. And that gives us enough time to adjust some of the provisions, to have a commission that looks at what's going on, but it puts us on a path that I think by the time ours becomes effective, it would not surprise me to see Massachusetts, Maine, and several other states, Hawaii among them, going in this direction. And possibly Canada to our north. And possibly Under Canada to our leadership. north, although, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm not, I really don't follow the politics in Canada as much, mm -hmm. as closely as I should, mm -hmm. I suppose. But didn't, didn't the New Hampshire House uh, move some kind of legalization two legislation? Two years ago, actually. Oh, two years um, ago. <laughs> the story was old. Oh, okay. By the time it got to, <laughs> okay. it got to you. Very good. <laughs> so, given, given the efforts that you've uh, made in your committee to scale it back to a reasonable right. place where you can feel comfortable reasonable on it. Reasonable place for me, not for you. Correct. Many people, it's not reasonable. Uh, do you expect to be voting for I this? I will be, I, as long as there isn't some uh, killer 
amendment put mm -hmm. in, for example, to start to lift the several penalties July 1, 2016. Mm -hmm. As long as something like that isn't put in, I will, I will vote for the measure as it's been amended significantly. Okay. And, you, and it has the votes in your committee? Uh, well, two sponsors of the bill are in the committee of yeah. the original bill, right. and Senator Ash has indicated that he would support legalization effort. Okay. Senator, I know you've got to run to yep. go take a vote, right. so we'll let you go. Thank you Thank you so much. much for joining us. Enjoy Thank you. joining you. Thank right. you. Thanks. As we noted at the top of the show, pot and uh, health care weren't the only major topics this week here in the legislature. Uh, the Senate Economic Development Committee finished its work on a paid sick leave bill, which passed the House last year on a very narrow vote. They made some changes that they say makes it a little more palatable to the business community, and that cleared uh, the, uh, the committee on a 5 nothing vote yesterday. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've had the education saga going on all week. Josh, you've been covering this fairly extensively. Uh, there was a let me set this up briefly for you. Sure, please. The Senate yeah. initially voted to repeal spending thresholds packed mm -hmm. la passed last year in Act 46. Mm -hmm. The House had a different version to raise the caps and reduce the penalties associated with them. Mm -hmm. And they were on a collision course. Mm -hmm. It's now Friday morning, and we see some resolution uh, in sight. Yeah, potentially. So uh, yesterday, the Senate, in various forms, there was a joint meeting of the Finance and Education Committees, then a full caucus, and then they broke up into separate meetings. And then after all this, they finally came to a compromise that is similar to what came out of the House. Right. And so that means they're going to raise they're going to raise each and every individual school district spending threshold by 0.9 percent. And so this is uh, kind of an acknowledgement of the fact that when they created this threshold legislation, they didn't really think about how it's going to impact people. Mm -hmm. And so when they learned uh, that uh, healthcare spending is projected to go up 7.9%, mm -hmm. and uh, people are going to have to pay for universal pre-K, which is rolling out this year, um, all of a sudden, all these districts, uh, kind of through no fault of their own, yeah. simply through the uh, results of the legislation that's been made here in this building, yeah. uh, found themselves over over these uh, <coughs> thresholds. So, they're, so they were going to raise the thresholds, and so the Senate agreed with that. Uh, the Senate also took an interesting step of exempting any school district from thresholds if that school district is below the average per pupil uh, spending, mm -hmm. which is roughly fifteen thousand okay. um, dollars. So the Senate proposal would find about 68 districts, if I, I, I believe, uh, six, mm -hmm. yeah, it's be 68 uh, di school districts are going to be over the spent spending thresholds. Okay. Uh, the House plan had 106 districts. I see. Um, both of them would raise uh, residential property tax rate, uh, assuming that you're not income sensitized, mm -hmm. would raise that by about two cents um, okay. and would bring in roughly between 1.8 and 1.9 million dollars in tax penalty re re revenue, depending on which right. plan you And the House with. was on the low, low end and the Senate was on the high end of yes. that range. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what's happening right now as we speak, we're, we're, we're taping this right now at uh, right about 10.30 in the morning on Friday. Um, so the House members have since received the amended bill back from right. the Senate and they are in the process of caucusing. The Republicans and Democrats have broken up and they're talking about what's going to happen. And if I understand so. things correctly, the House cannot amend this any further. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have to go to conference committee. Right. So it's either going to be a straight up or down vote or go to conference committee. Yeah. Uh, now, there's an imperative for people um, to get this done today. Uh, because uh, Sunday is the last day that municipalities can warn their uh, proposed budgets mm -hmm. if people are voting by ballot on town meeting day. And so lawmakers have set you know this weekend uh, right. as being the final day. Now, in actuality, most school districts who are going to be warning their budgets uh, finalized them weeks ago. They are not hanging right. with bated breath to see what these right. guys are going to do. Um, however, there are roughly 120 school districts that vote by floor, and so you can do whatever you want on the mm -hmm. floor. It's like Thunderdome. Yeah. Um, and you so can make amendments, you, you can make, make changes, do whatever you, you want. You can do whatever right. you want on the floor. And so this will benefit uh, those folks in terms of they'll, they'll have more clarity mm -hmm. than uh, their counterparts that have to uh, plan for their budgets earlier this month right. without knowing what's going to happen here today. Okay. Should it pass today, the governor's office says that the governor's the governor will review it this evening, uh, most likely sign it tonight or tomorrow uh, and, and move this thing forward. But I want to get to sort of the politics of this. Mm -hmm. um, the Senate's original position was very strong vote. Uh, 
uh, to repeal the spending thresholds altogether. And I think a lot of people in this building thought that because it was such a strong vote, that voice would prevail in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, but it appears that the Senate has moved much closer to the House position than the House moved toward the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, is, this a, is this a major victory for the House here? Yeah, I mean, uh, you could really look at this as, you know, uh, House and Senate lawmakers have really been playing a game of chicken here for the last mm -hmm. few weeks. And so House members are prepared to say, you know what, you don't take our compromise, we're going to go ahead and leave the existing thresholds in place. Uh, which would capture 127 school districts right. and bring in $9.5 million in tax mm -hmm. penalty revenue. And it would hit people that are spending below average, hit people that are spending above average, anyone who goes, who, who goes over their threshold. Right. And so House is held strong with, uh, you know, I dare, pretty much they're daring the Senate to say, you know what, the yeah. people we have in place. The Senate never wanted the thresholds in the first place. The thresholds were a product of a conference committee uh, during the creation of Act 46 uh, last May, and they never wanted them in the, in the first and this place. And this was to essentially grab support from House Republicans. Yes. Uh, and move something forward. Yes. So. And so uh, they, and uh, House uh, folks are just really committed to keeping these thresholds, uh, and uh, they just did not have the votes. Uh, at one point uh, earlier this week, on the House floor, there was an amendment to repeal the thresholds altogether. I think it drew uh, 30 votes right. out of uh, 150. Right. So it was not a popular move by any stretch. All right. So bottom line, House won the game of chicken? It looks that way. All right. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Josh. And Thank we'll you. leave this week's episode of Capital Beat uh, right here. You can catch this show on Orca Media and other statewide uh, community access channels and on VermontPressBureau.com. Thanks again for joining us.